My name is Neil Graboy, and I'm the dean of the Milano School, I'm going to use the new name, the Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and Public Policy. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this, this panel, one of several panels run by the estimable Carol Anderson, and I'm grateful for all that she does in pulling together these opportunities for graduate alumni and for current students to get a sense of particular opportunities uh, upon graduation. Today our focus is on urban development, and I have to say, looking around at, the, at cities and what is happening, the issues associated with urban development uh, couldn't be riper for people with talent and people who have insight, knowledge, and background because we desperately, desperately need it. I think New York seems to be doing reasonably well, uh, but most places don't have uh, mayors of uh, uh, Mr. Bloomberg's, I don't know what to say, wealth, capacity, whatever appropriate well, word. True. Seems to make a difference since I guess he could make up any budget deficit we have. Uh, but given the state of the economy, the ne neglect of infrastructure, which seems to me really a crucial issue since I ride the subway every day. Uh, the problems uh, that city governments are unfortunately saddled with, uh, withdrawal from social support of people who are needy, which is going to happen more and more. Uh, urban development will clearly depend increasingly on innovation, entrepreneurial capacity, acumen, and uh, the capacity to do more with less. Uh, I think, uh, I know, both Milano and GPIA have focuses on the urban world, and it's one of the things that uh, brings us together in a very natural way. So it's important to be exploring urban development in this particular panel. And I can't imagine uh, better representatives of the opportunities in urban development uh, than we have uh, here today. And I uh, thank you again uh, for all that you do, Carol. And I want to uh, introduce our uh, moderator, uh, Charles Allison, uh, who will do magical things, I'm sure, uh, with eliciting questions, uh, responding to uh, interesting answers, and in general, uh, helping us understand some of these issues that uh, you folks are all going to face, and I'm going to face as a as a consumer, I'm not going to school anymore. I'm not looking for any more jobs. All I want is a good city to live in. Charles. Thank you very much. If it's OK, maybe I'll just sort of sit here, uh, as opposed to uh, so standing if, uh, if everyone can hear me. Uh, well, thank you very much for coming. I think we're very excited uh, to have such an esteemed and diverse panel uh, based on uh, background, experience, um, relationship with the new school and so forth. Uh, but the theme here is urban economic development at, at the end of the day uh, is a very broad field. And there are lots and lots of different places you can go with it, with a degree here. And um, our panelists have a broad variety of places where they have been. And perhaps they'll tell us a little bit where they're going uh, and how that may, and how their uh, specific uh, training and skills and relationships that they built here at the new school have uh, affected uh, and impacted that good, bad, and ugly. So um, what I'd uh, like to do is ask uh, each of the panelists, I mean, you have their bios, but I'd like each of the panelists to spend maybe five minutes uh, just talking a little bit, introducing themselves, and telling you what they want you to know in that five minute period of time about who they are and what they're about. So maybe we could just go in order uh, and start that way. Okay, on the spot. Uh, okay, I was assured I didn't need to prepare my words, so that, that never really stops me from speaking, but I want to be poignant and, uh, and, and relevant. Um, so Rebecca Lurie, I guess you see that. Um, I finished my Milano degree about three years ago, and when I decided to go back, it may be quite obvious, it was a mid-career shift. And the shift was I was, um, I was in a pretty decent job that I had moved into. I'll explain that in a second, but I wanted to... Um, I wanted to change jobs, but I felt like I needed a master's degree to do that because I, the only way I would have moved was with who I knew. 
and certainly it's also what I know, but um, without a degree, I wasn't able to compete with, I think, people in their 20s and early 30s. So I graduated high school in 1976. You can do the math, but I want to give you that context because being at, at this point a mature person in, in the workforce, um, you're competing with people who are really have the standard is to have a high, a high degree. Uh, an advanced degree, and we didn't have that in the, I mean, we had them, but if you weren't in academia, it often wasn't the case. Actually, I finished high school, and I went, and I went to college, and um, somewhat worked through college, through, through, through the public system, and ended up a carpenter. We ended up as a union apprentice, and ended up working with my hands, and it was a, a confluence of circumstances that are not um, unique to me, but everybody has different struggles that happen, and so some things that happened to me meant that I sort of took this opportunity that came across my, my life, which was, I was living upstate, and somebody said, uh, some friends of mine who actually were, worked in a cooperative business, and it was a co-op for uh, food co-ops, their job, and this was in the, in the early 80s, they had a business, it was the Federation of Food Co-ops, and they delivered food to food co-ops in the Northeast. Now this is the early 80s, so food co-ops were not as big then. It was actually when the Park Slope Food Co-op, people know about it, was really just starting. But their job was, uh, a, they were a cooperative, and they had a truck and a warehouse, and they were moving food around the Northeast. And they were young hippies, sort of like me, and they, but they, they were moving into a larger, a larger warehouse. It's a small business development story combined with mine. They were moving into a large warehouse and they were socially conscious and they put in their contract that whoever got the work to renovate that new warehouse had to train a woman or a minority. And friends of mine got the contract, asked me if I wanted a job. I had just finished uh, college. I was looking for work. I didn't even have outfits for the real official job interview, but they all knew I could work with my hands. So I said, yeah, that sounds great. So I ended up being a carpenter by by chance. Well, within a few months, I signed up with the union to get into their apprenticeship program. They had never even seen a woman come through their doors before asking for that position. That was unique. So I spent the next 14 years being sort of unique and a pioneer as a woman in the trades. But a, a big part of what happened for me in that very first job was an urban was a, a progressive policy that a business said, we want to make a difference with these dollars. And, and I think that, that one act is a common thread throughout my career. So now I'm at the age where I can sort of look back and say, what are some common themes? And one of them is looking at where policy pushes progress and where we can influence that. So as I became a carpenter and worked with my tools, I started teaching. You could look at my, my little piece there. I, I explain I, I got uh, some, adv some advanced degrees in, in occupational education. And then because I was smart enough to sort of write the grants, I ended up writing grants. And, and over time, I was doing workforce development in a labor environment, but I was doing workforce development that was very much partnered with industry. And at every point, I was always looking for those opportunities. I've done a lot with minorities getting into the trades, women getting into the trades, looking at other industries unrelated to the trades, and looking at how people get access. And my job mostly has been to do education for that. The, as I said, the reason to get the degree at Milano was in order to compete in a broader world outside of the world I had sort of grown up in was to, um, to get a degree. It was May of 2008 when I graduated, and in fall of 2008 was the crash. I think we can call it that, whatever we want to call it. The, the economy, it became apparent that it was hard to find work. Um, so I kind of stayed where I was. My job kept shifting, though, because I, I I had the, um, the wherewithal to be able to, I, I guess I had some self-confidence that came with the degree that said, I, I see there are some changes we ought to be a part of and people would listen. And so my job shifted. I was doing workforce development. I was doing more development. Mostly I wanted to do a lot around the triple bottom line and sustainability. And I understood that when I went into graduate school. And four years later, I was doing that in my organization. But I think it's okay to think that. Uh, people should move every so often. And I feel a little trapped because of where the economy is, but ready to make some shifts. And I think that that's one of the things that the degree has done for me is feel like I could, even though there are some golden handcuffs involved, some, some barriers with a bad economy, I still know that I, I have the wherewithal. I can be very valuable in a lot of other places than where I am, although they consider me quite valuable, but um, We've crossed the board, we've only gotten pay cuts since, I bet, since, since the recession. And that's part of what happens in a nonprofit environment and I think sort of an old-fashioned organization. We can talk more about that later, but 
um, probably my five minutes is up. I'm not keeping track. I was trying to. But um, in questions, people can ask more, and I can fill it out. Thanks. Oh, that's great. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Paul? Sure. Um, I guess if I had one message today, it's um, really no limits. Um, and that the degree is applicable to a much broader range than I think people think about it. Um, I went to Milano in a different uh, sense, se century in, in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, I graduated um, what was then called the uh, Department of Urban Affairs and Policy Analysis in 1977. Um, and I had ended up at, um, at the school because I was really interested in urban policy and urban planning. Um, and New York was actually in really, really awful shape. And I had been born and raised in New York. And I thought it would be really interesting to be here. Um, when I came here, I think all my friends thought I had totally lost um, all my brains because the city was really in awful shape. Um, give you a sense, I lived at um, 13th and 8th um, because it was obviously close to school. School was across the street on, on, at 5th and 13th. I guess it still is. Um, and. Um, uh, I was considered to live on a uh, dangerous block, so um, give you a sense of how much the city's changed. Um, and you know, it was a really interesting place because a lot of the debate that was happening then, which is somewhat similar to the debate uh, that's happening now, is the tremendous lack of resources and how does government deal with that. Um, and many of the same thoughts of you know the about what do you what do you do? How do you deal with the city workforce? Um, you know, I often think the current mayor gets a lot of credit for the very hard things Ed Koch did in the late 1970s and early 80s to really rethink how, how, how government works, which is an experience I think the states are first going, going through now. Um, so I, I got out of, uh, out of this school and um, I must say all my early jobs were from uh, alumni of the school, uh, a uh, guy who was a year at head of me hired me uh, to work with him at um, Chase Manhattan Bank. Chase Manhattan at that time had a lot of real estate investment in New York. They were trying to get rid of all of it because it was clear to them that New York was never coming back. Um, just to give you a sense, Karen, Karen, Karen Gerard, who was uh, head, the chief economist for Chase, probably the most important chief economist in the country at the time, wrote a report basically saying the emerging banking centers, this is 1978, in America will be Chicago and Los Angeles, which I will point out do not have a single money center bank headquartered there now. Um, so none of these reports mean anything is sort of what I learned very early on. Um, but, but seriously, he, he hired me to sort of work in their, um, their uh, urban I investment pro program. And we're trying to figure out how to salvage some money for New York in the context of a bank that was really trying to disinvest. And after a year, a year of that, and just deciding banking really wasn't for me, through another uh, uh, alumni here, a guy named Jim Capolino, who um, some of you may know, and went on to become a deputy mayor, the youngest deputy mayor in New York City history, alumni a year ahead of me. Um, I decided I wanted to sort of figure out how urban de development happened and went, went to work for the Public Development Corporation, which at the time had basically no employees. Um, and went to work there, and we sort of cre cre created the idea of the city acting as a really active partner in urban economic development, which New York City had never been before. It had done urban renewal, but it had never looked at itself as basically act as a partner. And the first thing I did when I got there was um, we had a bank come to us, Irving Trust, now the bank, bank in New York. They just wanted to tell us they were on their way to White Plains. And we just said, gee, you know, we're going to find a way for you to stay in the city. And we ended up doing a project, 101 Bar or Broccoli Street, which they built. And it was the first building built in New York in about 10 years. Um, how does this all relate to, uh, to, to Milano? I think, you know, what that really experience in the city taught me was the importance, which I learned here, of issue analysis and really thinking things through. Um, and so when Irving Trust came to the city, my focus was the importance of those jobs um, and not um, what everyone else was thinking about was space and maybe we could put them on, on, on Staten Island and trying to really understand where banks were going. And we created the first op op operations center in the city. Doesn't sound like a lot, so what? But then I met a guy named Bruce Randner who was co commissioner of consumer affairs, ended up working at a company called Forest City. Um, and we did six million square feet of operation centers in downtown Brooklyn, otherwise known as Metrotech. 
Um, but again, it was that same basic analysis, which was what are banks about? Why are they in New York? Because they really could be anywhere. Um, and that combination of both talent, but also the sort of the importance of technology in banking, um, which I think we were the first ones to understand. Um, you know, I then, um, I was at Far City for 10 years. We did a, um, a, a development project called uh, Metrotech, which some of you may know. Um, you know, very much a public-private uh, de development project. I had to interface with the city on a daily basis. I still do, which I think everyone who works in real estate in New York does. Um, and I think, and I've now moved on to um, head my own firm, Washington Square Partners. We're again involved in very large development projects in the city, including Moynihan Station, um, a project called City Point in downtown Brooklyn, which would be ultimately about two million square feet. Um, you know, how do I stay afloat in um, a competitive and cu cu cutthroat industry, which some of you may see from watching HGTV or whatever? <laughs> this is not a, it's not a kind or um, gentle I I industry. And I really think that what the school gave me um, and continues to give me is that ability to think through to what is ultimately the project about and how to develop it ar around that. Um, and I think that's a real competitive a a advantage. There's also the competitive advantage that I think this is a school that really sees the public and private sectors as intertwined and not separate from each other. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I continue to think of Milano as being very important training for me. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Soledad? My name is Soledad Ursua. I graduated in 09. And I think for me, I just needed something more. I knew I wanted to do finance, but I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do. Um, I thought about an MBA, but I didn't want to just be a number cruncher in a bank. I thought that Milano could sort of provide me with an MBA with a social conscience, if that's possible. I wanted to focus more on where the public meets the private to create these win-win situations where you have a little bit of federal subsidy and you have private money. Um, I definitely got my start through alumni. There was a very nice man by the name of Paul Travis at Washington Square Partners. He let me work on um, my PDR report with him. So he had a project, it was in downtown Jamaica. Um, it was a new market tax credit deal and that was the first time that I learned about these tax credits. And I think for me that really was this idea of a win-win, where you have this federal subsidy for developers who are willing to go into areas where they would typically stay out of. So I really loved that concept, and I think from the PDR it allowed me to sort of network within this new markets community that's very small. Um, there's rarely ever any job openings. It's all the same people. So. You know, I was able to contact multiple um, community development entities, and through there, I found a job, and I've been working with the program ever since. And I still talk to Paul. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think for me, what Milano taught me was to be creative. I know that you know, right now, I'm at a private company, and for them, these tax <laughs> credits are mind blowing. That. I mean, not everybody understands the public world, and the public world doesn't always understand the private world. And I think today we're entering this era of constrained resources, and cities and states need to get smart and better leverage their money. And I think there's significant opportunity in this world of public-private ventures. I think I was a little short, but. <laughs> oh, no, that's OK. Great. No, thank you very much. Uh, Mitchell. Yeah, speak a little closer to the mic yeah. is that because of the recording. Um, I came to the graduate program in international affairs in 2007 from a position that I was working in, in Beijing, China. Um, and I knew uh, when I entered that I wanted to focus on the uh, cities and urbanization concentration. And generally that I had interests, broad interests in urban policy in developing countries. Um, and as I progressed uh, at GPIA, um, I guess to provide a counterpoint uh, to what has been previously said, I began to realize that there might actually be some limitations to what, uh, where, and um, in what institutions I could work to actually get the chance 
um, to work on problems of urbanization and urban policy in developing countries coming from being a US citizen. Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, have the opportunity to spend a semester uh, back in China uh, at a research center in Western China looking at urban policy um, in the city of Chongqing, which is out west. And then I followed that up with a fellowship from the Indochina Institute and spent time in India. So I was able to build, I think, a um, sufficient level of experience so that when I did finish, um, I was an attractive candidate, or somewhat attractive, to the right institutions. Um, and so through Michael Cohen, uh, the director of the Graduate Program of National Affairs, I was connected with the Asian Development Bank. And they had, in the fall of 2009, um, their South Asia division had um, come into an agreement with <clears throat> the Ministry of Finance of India to do a technical assistance study on municipal finance reform in India. And I uh, was contacted and applied and got a position to do a literature review um, on municipal finance systems in federal countries as an input into this study. And that became my first consultancy with the Asian Development Bank. Um, it ended up being a long report. It was definitely a challenge um, and I did it over the first half of 2010, right out of graduating. From that experience uh, came, I was supposed to follow up with a second consultancy with Asian Development Bank, actually in India, connected with the same study, which subsequently fell through because someone in the Ministry of Finance, who I don't know, uh, nixed, nixed the consultancy. Um, and it was confusing to me at the time. I had no idea what was going on. I, I wasn't under an official contract, but I had signed a preliminary inquiry um, into the position, and I thought that everything, I thought I was gonna be going to India, and there were plans being made, and I was working on, on reading through materials that were being sent to me, and then I got an email just out of the blue one day, sorry, you're not going, it's been canceled. What ended up happening is they restructured uh, the, the uh, institute that was the partner agency in India, the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy restructured the consultancy and I was able to do it from here in New York. But it was much smaller um, and, and it really came as a surprise to me. I was then contacted again in December of last year to work on another uh, technical assistance study that they were doing. Uh, sorry, not a technical assistance study, a, an internal study. Um, that they were doing, the Sustainable Development Division is doing on uh, the concept of sustainability, how it gets operationalized within their uh, project lending and grant operations, and this idea of integrated infrastructure operations, which is to say that the bundling of infrastructure. Right now, it's, it's sort of conventional practice, not just at the Asian Development Bank, but at the World Bank as well. Most of the multilateral development banks are sort of silo institutions, and so the energy sector does energy projects, the water sector does water projects, um, and then transport sector, do, sector does road projects. Then there's this urban sector, urban division, that they really don't, they do, they do things across sectors, but they're, they're much smaller than, than the traditional se sectors. And the ADB is looking to reform those practices. They don't know if it's necessary, if it's really feasible and what it might look like institutionally uh, for them as either a development or as a, as a bank or as a development institution, but that's what they're looking at. And so that's what I'm currently working on and the consultancy is actually scheduled to end towards the end of this month, but we're not certain if that's going to happen or not. So that's where I am, I guess, uh, Looking back, I, I was fortunate, I think, in my case, to really become aware of what needed to happen uh, for me to really be able to work on the issues that I wanted to work on in an international context. Um, I, I definitely think that the, the career sort of trajectory and approach varies between Milano and the GPIA, um, and there are different entry points. Um, and uh, with all that in mind, I applied last fall 
to do a PhD or uh, for in multiple PhD programs to do a PhD in uh, urban planning. So I'm waiting to hear about that. But it, it, in short, it really became apparent to me that you really there are limitations if you really want to work on international issues and, for example, urban policy. In my case, you really have to go for a big multilateral, a big global institution that can provide that platform for you. And so that's, that's sort of where I am right now. Great. Um, actually, I'm so excited uh, listening to the panelists. And really, I only know one of them and have just met the other three. And I want to talk about the union situation in Wisconsin. I want to ask about more about the city point and where you think that's going. Uh, I'm dying to talk about uh, the differences between India and China and infrastructure and, and Soledad sitting on, I guess, uh, you know, a big chunk of money in an environment, in a venture capital environment, which when she started out, I'm sure she never really thought that was kind of the way things were going to be uh, with her sort of double bottom line orientation. I think I could monopolize the questions all by myself, okay? <laughs> But I'm going to exercise some discipline and just ask one question for each panelist. Um, and then hopefully uh, you all will step up and ask questions. Oh, right. Sorry. Gee, thanks, Carol. Um, <laughs> does everybody see the uh, index card that you have uh, in your seat? Or maybe you're sitting on it? Uh, what you should do is uh, you know, grab a couple extras and write down questions. And then they will be collected. And uh, they'll come up and we'll sort of address the questions sort of that way, I guess. That's what we're doing. So we can capture the questions and provide them to you. Well, that's certainly one way of doing it. H happy to do that. So um, I didn't really read my instructions carefully enough to know that's what we were doing. I like to repeat the questions into the mic, but that's okay. We'll do it with the cards because it, it, it's very important to get the information captured uh, for those that couldn't be here. And hopefully we'll have the benefit of watching. Uh, Mitchell sort of jumped the gun a little bit and kind of answered my question uh, before I even asked it, which you know, makes me even more interested in talking to him. Uh, but what I'd like to ask each of you is, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, now you, you all have various degrees of hindsight and various lengths of hindsight, just pick a hindsight point. With the benefit of hindsight, what is it that you know that you wish you had known day one when you started at uh, the new school? Tough. Ooh. Wow. There's a. Uh, there's. 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 Well, you know, no particular order. And and maybe if you if I could if I could give you a little more guidance on it, think about um, you know if you want or you can answer it otherwise. Think about skills. What uh, what skills maybe do you think, given the benefit of hindsight, might you wish you had known on day day one? Oh, I know. Um, the graduate program for international affairs was not presented to me at the time. Um, as a connection, it seemed like there was, the new school seemed very um, siloed. It seemed, it, it was perceived to me as such. I looked at a few different opportunities for training. I, I knew that I was in the nonprofit sector, and because of my relationship to labor, I also was very interested in the business sector. That might seem odd, but labor management partnerships really appealed to me. So I was looking at an MBA or some sort of progressive MBA. I've become a big fan of Henry Mintzberg, if people know him. So. Um, but I didn't really, I, I like you know, I said, and so I'll repeat it again, I, I'm, and I see on the panel, I'm the only one who was a returning, I think, I'm making assumptions about the folks at the other end of the table, but I, I was really mid-career, and I, I could go on without a degree and I could be fine. Many of my uh, peers do that. So for me, it was what my, my search for, for an education, for, for an advanced degree was what would matter to me? What, what, did, what was going to, like, enrich me? It, it, um, so that I could have that, that initial after my name and demonstrate. And also, I mean, I wanted to get some 21st century skills that come with, that a lot of young people have that have to do with technology. And I want to be able to like dig in and do research officially and know, know those things. But I didn't understand how much I could have connected to the other schools, particularly the international affairs, which now has actually merged. So, um, because I was looking at maybe nonprofit, maybe an MBA, I also looked at the HR part of Milano, which I'm not even sure if it's still there. So I, I was like going to, I remember running up and down the building to three different orientations. 
And then when I heard about organizational change management, I said, that's, that's my fit. That's my fit. Because I've been struggling to change organizations from a, from a very young age. I was an activist. I mean, I grew up heavily influenced by the civil rights movement. And I just, wherever I was, I was like pushing those issues. So I didn't feel like I needed a degree that was going to shape me. I needed a degree that was going to enhance me. And, and um, I w because I've always had an international perspective as well, I, I would have done better. Not, I, I didn't do po poorly in any way, but I think I would have enjoyed or appreciated some more classes in the international spectrum from, from the other side of the school. I guess I would say looking back, um, and you know, if I look at the alumni from my year, um, we're in a very, very wide range of jobs. I mean, there's virtually nothing in common among the 23 of us, I think it is now. Um, really, um, very, very few of us are in the same field at, at all. Um, Emily Yusuf, who I think taught here at one point, is probably the, uh, the one I'm clo closest to in career. She's president of the New York City Housing development corporation and really one of the experts in the city on housing finance. Um, but looking back, I would say the skill that um, I wish I knew more about um, when I was here, um, and we, well, it wasn't really offered here at the time, um, really is uh, the importance of finance and, bu 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 and budgeting, whether you're in the public sector, at which point you're constantly struggling with uh, budgets, which are never enough. Or in, your, the, or you're in the private sector where you're struggling with um, budgets which you're always going to overspend. Um, you know, that, that importance of how to, how to make a budget work. Um, and I've spent the last 30 years, I swear, reading pro formas every day. So, um, um, and I'm very self-taught at this point, which is fine, but I think having that basic skill, I think almost at this point, and certainly watching what's happening in Wisconsin and elsewhere, um, just to go back to your, your question, um, is really become t absolutely cri critical, I think, at this point, to a successful career in either the public or the private sector. Great, thank you. And then, I mean, I think for me, looking back, um, I wish I would have uh, networked much more. I know that Carol Anderson would encourage us to network, and I never really took it to that level. And it wasn't until working on my PDR, I hit a, just a bump in the road. There wasn't information on new market tax credits out there. And so I had to get creative. And you know, my dad suggested, why don't you email that guy, Michael Novogratik, that is the CPA that writes all the books? And I thought, oh, that's ridiculous. He'll never email me back. But I was desperate, so I sent him an email. And he responded. And he said, oh, you're a graduate student. Why don't you come into our offices? You can read the book, spend as much time with it as you'd like. This is an $800 book. It's not in any library. The closest one was Syracuse, and I wasn't going to travel up there. Um, and then I just started you know, going through a list of all these allocatees and sending them an email. And suddenly, someone from Capital One would write back and say, oh, you're a student. I'll talk to you about this. And so people, I found that people were actually, they were willing to speak to a student because it's not as threatening. They're probably flattered that you care about this specific industry that most people don't really care about at all. And so I think really just networking, you know, to find out information for Paul's project, it just, I just suddenly realized that I could just contact all of these people and ask them questions. And I would say about 80% were, you know, very willing to talk to me. And I ended up starting off my first job at um, Urban America. It was a real estate fund. And so I had done that because he was nice enough to let me come in and interview him for my project. And I kept in touch with him. And, you know, today I can't do that. I can't email a bank and ask them questions. I mean, nobody would give me that kind of information. But I think. I wish I would have used my student um, status more because people are willing to talk to you. And that wasn't really until my last semester. And I just thought, oh, you know, I should have been doing this all, the whole year and a half before. So I think that was it, just realizing that I can contact these people, that they'll talk to you, they want students to learn, and people are much friendlier than you imagine. Well, Mitchell, even though I kind of gave you credit for uh, answering the question, do you have something else you'd like to add? I, well, I would like to second that networking uh, point, it's, it's especially now more than ever. I mean, it's, you can't overstate it. 
And the other thing is the importance, in my case, uh, at, at GPIA and what I've done since, the importance of in-depth, long-form writing and analysis. Uh, you know, the time constraints on faculty members often result in term papers and analyses that you perform in the classroom setting of five to 10 to 15 at most 20 pages. And sometimes you overshoot it, sometimes you undershoot it. It turned out that the two consultancies that I did last year, I had to write on my own 65 plus page analyses. I mean, that's what they turned into. And while I did the thesis option at the Graduate Program in International Affairs, that was my only sort of engagement in this long form detailed analysis where, that you're gonna get questioned on, you're gonna get asked to follow up on. And you know, at GPA you read these large UN World Bank documents, you know, state of the world development type documents. But I mean, maybe I never imagined myself having to write, a, a, you know, sort of a section of that or something like a section of that. And I probably should have because it's what you're asked to do in a lot of these consultancies. You're, you're not doing really detailed policy analysis on the ground and you know summarizing it into five you know a short five page note it's you know you're writing a second a third a fourth thesis but you're not ha you don't have the whole semester to do it you have two months um, you know to get it out and and that's stressful and it and it's a skill that is necessary but it is something you have to cultivate and so knowing that up front would have been very helpful okay questions from the audience the, the question, um, if I can sum, summarize it a bit, uh, in the context of career uh, transition, especially in an international arena with uh, uh, changes occurring as quickly as they are today, um, how uh, would each of you comment on uh, opportunities or uh, situations in your, uh, in your sphere, in your background, where there have been large paradigm shifts, and how have you dealt with that? Uh, what advice would you have in terms of, in terms of that? Please, all I'll, I'll start. Um, one of the shifts that I saw happening when I was in graduate school, so again, the timeline is sort of six years ago to three years ago, I was working. I was a working parent then going to school, so, so that's, that adds to the environment from the personal side. But I, I became really intrigued around sustainability. And I swear, the term, I don't think the term was hardly coined. <laughs> It very quickly became one. I mean, certainly a term that wasn't coined was green, and now everybody, you know, there are so many meanings to that word. But um, I became really intrigued because I was always interested in what you had referred to as the double bottom line, which is sort of um, for people and for business, and how do you how do you get equity and and economic success in one, and then you add to that how do you give a damn about the environment while that's all happening and. And I saw before my eyes that shift become, I think it's, it's quite ubiquitous now. I'm not sure, I mean, it'd be interesting to see if other people think that, but I, either I'm seeing it everywhere or it's, it's having a huge impact. And I'm seeing it, I mean, I, it's, it's pretty out there. I think people are beginning to use the term triple bottom line. They're talking about sustainability as the environment. I, I sometimes are, I'm concerned that equity issues are not always there. It's almost like a, when I look around this room, which is filled with a mural about issues of equity and inequity, and I'm like, we can't forget that how people go to work each day, let's talk about um, Wisconsin and, and the respect that people get on the job and, and the care for the environment is, is becoming something that you can really speak to quickly now. And, and, um, and I think for me the shift was because I didn't change my, I changed my title, but and I changed some of the work that I do, but I stayed with the same company, was that I've become somewhat of a, of a seer or a sage. People said, oh, Rebecca, she saw that coming. And now there's like a lot of recognition that that's happening. And I come to, I, I, people approach me as the one who has that insight. And I think that I'm, I may have been a seer before, and I just thought it was like ESP or something. But now I understand it's actually a way that I look at things. 
And I got that from my education here, was understanding that there are different ways to look at things. And sometimes one way, it's not the only way, but one way to look at things is to sort of look, look forward, look on the horizon, imagine all the possible situations and what's happening, and can you be prepared for what's at the horizon? And I think that that is very valuable in any team, is people who can think far out and, and think of possibilities and sort of say, let's, let's look at that, even though I think sometimes we take tremendous risk by doing that, because not all those things come true. So, so someone once told me something uh, recently, um, you know, it's, it's easy to have a lot of ideas, but you have to have a lot of ideas to have a few great ones. And so it, it became okay for me to think far out um, it was really far out when I said, we got to think about green job training, when I said that six years ago and five years ago. And now people are coming to us for that expertise. So um, figure out what your niche is, what your strength is, because you can hold that and take that, and, and that, that's what translates. Yeah, I also think, um, you know, when I look back, was things were changing a lot. And I, I think things were always changing, but certainly in the mid-70s and, and late-70s in New York, things were constantly moving. It was very hard to get a grasp on what was going on. And um, I think what I learned, very importantly, was not to treat this as a vocational school. And what I mean by that is, you know, I really, I was working at Chase. I hated it. I hated being a banker. And so that's absolutely right. It's the most boring thing anybody could ever do. They can't be paid enough money to actually have to sit there in eight hours and do, and do what they do. It's really, really boring. So I knew I wanted to, to get out. Uh, it's incredibly boring. Um, and, um, and my first thought, because I had gone here, was I'll go to work at city planning. And there were no jobs because all the city planning, believe it or not, in those days was civil service. I'll say a heretical thing at the new school. It's a wonderful thing that a lot of New York City government is no longer civil service. It actually saved New York City government. But I know we shouldn't be saying that. But anyway. Um, but, um, but so the reason I ended up in economic development was that was the only place I could get a job. Um, I knew nothing about real estate. I literally could not tell you what a ground lease was. I didn't, I never read a lease in my life, other than I guess the one for my uh, uh, apartment. Um, I literally knew nothing. And, but, but I, you know, what I understood then after doing that was the basic skill set was applicable and I needed to think beyond, okay, I didn't take a class in real estate in grad school, therefore I can't be in that job. And, and I think that's, and partially, you know, you, so they were paying so little they would take me with no experience. And one of my pieces of advice for you t to this day is governments have no money. They don't pay any money. They'll take people with less experience than anyone else. It's just the nature of government. You know, they have no choice. And, and I think that's really, to me, when you start in a really difficult climate, you know, people say there's no hiring going on. That means New York State this year will hire, you know, 20,000 employees instead of 60,000 employees. And yet, that's what no hiring means in, 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 a, in a real life, in, 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 a, in a governmental or, or organization. So, I mean, my two pieces are, number one, don't treat it as vacation. Number two, in bad times, really go to government. It's low salary. It's going to drive you insane, but it's great experience. Um, I think one point also, um, you know, I think that with a lot of companies, we see that they can keep a competitive advantage when they're constantly innovating and changing. That there's that saying that, you know, you need to, what is it? You're either running or you're falling behind. And I think that you almost need to treat that with yourself, just treating yourself as a company that you're running. Uh, we had a really weird year for new market tax credits. We weren't sure if the program would be reauthorized. It did, and you know we were going to have one in 2011. But sometimes the thought of these tax credit programs going away keeps me up at night. I wonder what I'm going to do with all this seemingly useless knowledge of corporate tax liability. And I realize that you know there's other programs out there. At the end of the day, it's finance. Person A wants money. Person B has that money. And what are they going to pledge in return for that loan? So I think that. You know, maybe I won't always work with new market tax credits. Maybe it's going to be some form of renewable energy credits. Um, I think that you just need to stay on top of it. Watch where the market's going. Now there's these um, foreign investor programs where, you know, Atlantic Yards, they've raised $250 million from foreign investors. Just the market is constantly changing, and I think you need to always look for new programs, try to understand them. Because, you know, my industry may not be around forever, but it doesn't mean that I'm just going to pack up and leave. 
I mean, today I'm starting to do more work on some of our VC lending, and I'm finding that, you know, I have a real estate background, and this is purely operating businesses, but I'm realizing that it's not that different. It's still the idea of lending, cash flow, and collateral. So I think that, you know, you need to expand your horizons more, learn as many different programs as possible, and you just never really know well, where you'll end up. I actually can <clears throat> add something to that. While, um, while paradigms of thinking and approaches might and do indeed shift very quickly these days, institutions frequently don't, or at least it's my observation. So uh, it's also good to develop conventional analytical skills and abilities to work within conventional structures uh, on, on these issues, particularly in the field of, in the urban sector. I mean, just because there, I mean, I've observed this, just because there's, uh, sustainability can often be rhetorical. And when push comes to shove, institutions fall back on what they do best, which is transport stays transport, water stays water. And if the, you know, the suggestion that you should combine an energy project or some type of intervention in the ener energy sector with the water sector is, you know, is too much to handle because that's not the way that we do things, you know. And so while, I mean, definitely think broadly, think creatively, but, uh, and to answer the other question, looking back, you know, sometimes I do regret not developing more skills within the sort of delineated fields of the urban sector because institutions often don't change as much or as quickly as you would like them to. Great. Um, uh, Mitchell, uh, an, an introduction from uh, Michael Cohen gets an interview. Uh, do you have any advice on um, how to close the sale? Like what, what the sort of step next step is once you get in the door at, at that level, based certainly given your experience? Well, in my case, I think what helped me out, probably because the communication was going on, the ADB's in the Philippines and I'm here in New York, and a lot of it was back and forth by email, actually. Um, and so what helped me in this situation was the experiences that I had in India and in China while I was a student. I think that sort of likely set me apart or at least convinced them that I was qualified enough. Um, and, you know, my situation was unique because I wasn't, I didn't do a face-to-face -face interview and it's a consultancy, it wasn't a permanent position. Um, but that's the kind of, I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that I, that I made those tough decisions to, to have those experiences because I think in the end that's what really did it for me. Um, it, it, it really wasn't a face-to-face -face type of communication. It was that background that helped. Great. Um, Solo Dad, how did, how did you sell yourself against MBAs? You mentioned that a little bit, but could you go into a little more detail? Um, well, first, I don't think, when I would meet with people, I don't think they really had their guard up. They didn't really know what they were dealing with or what the new school was. People asked if it was NYU. So I feel like I had kind of a blank slate. Um, so I feel like maybe people didn't expect as much from me, but I was just very straightforward with people and I said, look, I went to a private school and I learned to specifically underwrite these programs. And I think for a lot of these um, traditional private equity guys, they're just blown away that we learned this in school. This is something that is sort of recent for them and they They've never taken a class where you go through and you talk about your eligible basis and you know just what can be leveraged, what can't. So I think for them, they just they thought it was very strange, and they really liked this idea that you know we could go through compliance and we just understood these programs that they're now starting to focus on. So I think that you know I mean it's just, it's different. Like people don't really know what to make of you and you have these different set of skills, um, but it's not always a bad thing because I feel like some of the MBAs just don't get what I'm doing at all. And the lawyers don't get it at all. So it's almost, 
I don't want to say bringing diversity in, but I think it's um, allowing for us to brainstorm better, to come up with better ideas, um, just an, a better overall product. Great, thanks. Um, now, uh, Paul or Rebecca or Soledad, what types of professional development opportunities are available at your organizations? And, and when you do hire, what are some of the things you're looking for? Um, we haven't hired lately. <laughs> and I mean, we, we are a 26 year old nonprofit that is a child of organized labor, the organization I work for. And I think that um, organized labor obviously has its challenges. If you can imagine a project of organized labor, it may come with a lot of that baggage. I was responsible for the award of a $4 million grant a few months. Uh, in the past year, in 2010. It was very exciting for the organization. Great, this is good. This is, that wasn't, a, we have a much larger budget, but four million new dollars was exciting. And that meant we could hire people, and I was so excited. And I remember one day just writing all the job descriptions, because we had it all laid out, not one new hire, not one new hire. And what happened was we're, you know, we're, we're losing so much, we, and we are an organized, we have an organized labor force, so we have to, move people from within. Um, so the professional development is what becomes really important. How do I train people who were doing A to do you know, something completely different? But that's what I'm forced to do because it is somewhat of an old fashioned organization, um, a child of organized labor, we're gonna do that. So the professional development is m very much sort of mentoring on the job, not very formal. We do have a, a policy that reimburses people for education to some degree, uh, to, to the public, public education. Uh, numbers, but um, there was no real structured way to, to, do, to do that change. We just have to do it internally. No. Um, we also don't hire very much, and we have 12 em employees, so we're not a huge place. Um, so, you know, we hire like once a, a decade, I have a feeling. Um, we are actually now first thinking about hiring someone, which given the last three years is, you know, an astonishing right. fact. I mean... I really haven't talked much about it, but this was a really, you know, unbelievably bad three years in urban real estate, about as bad as it gets. And many of my um, sort of co cohort firms are gone. Um, so it's been a bad time, and so we, we got through and we're sort of thinking next. And I think when we hire, we sort of look for three things. One is um, quanti quantitative skills are really critical, um, really critical. Someone has to be able to sort of get off the ground running on quanti quanti quantitative skills. Um, secondly is ability to write, sort of what Mitchell was saying. We don't write things that are more than a page or two, but that ability to um, really write well. Um, you know, I, I got to say, you know, now having been sort of out in the world for many years, um, just because someone went to a fancy school does not mean they know, they know how to write. It's really amazingly true that we have people who graduated from Harvard and Yale and Princeton with graduate degrees, and they can't write a two-page a two piece of paper that explains what the basic point is. I mean, it's really, it's really have amazing how few people today can really write anything longer than in, than in e email. Um, and then third, I think, is really and very critically for us given we're really a service firm we're really working with other firms always and often with state and city government is the ability to sort of make your point um, in a meeting in five minutes um, which is why I think this place is such a strength because that's literally what you have when we go to look for work if I don't convince them in the first five minutes you're done I'm done I'm out of there um, I'm a small firm I'm not I don't have a big name um, I literally have five minutes to convince them, and my staff, who I guess I'm not always there, also have five minutes. And when we're negotiating with someone, you literally have five minutes to make your point or, or lose it. So, you know, that's not how people are trained in business schools, honestly. It's just not. So in my world, I, I have five minutes. So, um, you know, that's, that's what I'm looking for, someone who can explain very fast. Um, we're a pretty small firm, or we're a lean organization, um, but I think that we like it that way. We would rather just spread out the work among ourselves. But I know we will be hiring soon. Um, we'd like another junior associate in Florida. 
Uh, we're raising a small business investment company, and so one of the offices will be in Florida. So if you know anyone in Florida with some VC um, background and experience, let us know. Um, but I think that one of the things, like building off of what Paul said, I think that one of the characteristics we look for is just the ability to talk to people and to almost be charming in a way. We find that a lot of the, I mean, we're from New Orleans, that's where the company came from, and I feel like you do business with people you like. Uh, we often go out to dinners where, you know, you're just entertaining people and maybe it's not all business, but you want to be likable and, you know, when we send people out to, you know, raise money from investors, there's also, you've got to be very smart, well-spoken, but you've also got to be just a well-rounded person that can make light chit-chat and talk. I think that's very hard to find, to find almost someone that is a total package. Um, economic development appeals to me because it's so multi-issue and multidisciplinary, but employers seem to want a candidate to be focused and dedicated to a small subset of issues. Um, how have you navigated this, and how would you advise someone about this in terms of interviewing? So employers seem to want a candidate to be focused and dedicated to a small subset of issues. Um, however, uh, at some level, people tell you they want multi-issue and multidisciplinary. Focus on one thing. That's really my advice. You know, we, I think I, I do it all the time and I walk out of the room and I think, oh my God, well, what did I do? Um, you know, rather than go in a room and say, I know this and I know this and I know this and I know this, pick one thing that you really know well and hammer it home and convince them you're better at that than anyone else. Because while they say multidisciplinary, you know, they don't know what, I, I don't know what that means, honestly, seriously, but someone walks in and I, they're like the smartest zoning person in New York. I just think to myself, I'll figure out a way to use them because I really, that's a really useful talent to me. And I think bosses all over do that. I think they'll say multidisciplinary and you'll, I do it all the time in interviews. I throw out the 12 things my firm does and I can see halfway through my sentence, I've lost them. <laughs> they're off to the next person. So I've learned, you know, if I can say one thing my firm does well, I'll get the job, and, and that's my feeling generally in interviews. When I interview people, most people just tell me too much information. I do, don't need to know what they did in the sixth grade. You know, it's not really important to me. So tell, you, tell me about yourself. Doesn't mean you start in the yeah, sixth it's grade. It's actually the opposite. It's, the it's obviously opposite. the opposite. I think you tell them the one thing that you think might hook into something they're doing that you're really good at. Right. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, you know, my last. All the jobs that I found, uh, none of them were posted. It was just through, um, you know, references. And so the last one, um, you know, I met with the CEO. He invited me to come talk to him. I still didn't really know what he wanted to talk to me about. Um, I didn't know that he had a job opening, and so he just asked me my interests, and I just talked about new market tax credits and really just focused on what I actually did in my prior position. And then, you know, at the end of it, he just said, well, that's what we're looking for. So, you know, we'd love to start you off here. So I think it was just very focused and I didn't want to overwhelm him and talk about Milano, some of my other client projects. I just focused on, you know, what I was doing at my, you know, other job and just the specific type of work that I did. And, and if I could make an observation about that and as a follow-up to that question, I mean, you heard Soledad say there's an opportunity at, with her firm in Florida, so if there's anyone that has venture capital experience in Florida, they should apply. Now, you know, that's what, that's their wish list. That's what they'd like to happen. And she just told you 20 minutes ago, when she sort of got into this, she didn't have previous experience. She cobbled her way into the experience. She learned something here that, and with networking and elbow grease and hard work, um, she put a story together and talked to enough people and showed up, um, probably demonstrated some quantitative skills, probably demonstrated the ability to write in short, one page, two page, three page, and uh, probably, got to the point of making her point in five minutes or less. So even though she says we want someone that's got venture capital experience in Florida because of the SBIC, I think if you show up with, uh, an, first of all, you gotta know what an SBIC is. You need to understand what's required, what they do, and you can present yourself with that complete package. Well, maybe you'll get considered. 
And I think it's that ability to think a little bit outside of the box as opposed to getting scared off by a job description or something that seems too um, all-encompassing or, or, or to feel, well, I can't compete with someone that's got experience doing that. That's not true. Someone shows up with experience and they're not likable and, they don't, and you don't feel that they could exist on their own or what I call it is the, when you're in a meeting with someone, would you get up and leave the room and leave that person in the room? with either your client or your investor or that regulator? Uh, would you go to the bathroom or, heaven forbid, have to get up and walk around the block or whatever? Would you do that? And if that person fails that test, if you think, oh, gosh, because I, I don't want to come back and have the deal dead. I don't want to come back and have Armageddon. I don't want to come back and have a complete disaster. So someone may have experience, but if you won't leave the room, then that person with maybe a little bit less experience but it's more reliable is going to get a shot at the opportunity. So I, I, I hope that's, you know, that's kind of fair. Um, let's see. Uh, well, we've sort of asked this, but maybe you have a, you've answered this a little bit, but maybe, again, a little focused on this. Are there other coursework that you think might be useful in your respective fields you know, for students now or or people that maybe have just recently graduated that might have the opportunity to do some other type of uh, preparation. So I'll, I'll add, I, I answered that already. Just a show of hands, anyone here from or the OCM program, Organizational Change Management? So maybe, uh, so that's, that's the program I graduated from and we were not required to take it. I don't even know, who's from Urban Policy? Okay, the Urban Policy has this two, this two semester financial, what did they call it, the lab? Okay, everybody scared us away from that. Plus it was two full semesters and who could spare that, those credits? And I kind of wish I took that or something else. I'll tell you why. Financial analysis. You know, we're forced to take the quant and the, micro and the economics course, which are okay but, and, and give me some, some background. But I really would have liked more financial analysis. And, and um, that would, I would have gotten that if I had gone for an MBA. I would not have gotten out of an MBA a lot of the other things that function for me as an effective person in my, in my uh, career. But um, financial analysis, some course that would help with that would have been really helpful. I'm not sure I would add a lot. I mean, finance was, I think, the, to me, is the biggest issue. The other thing that I think is sort of interesting, and again, a tremendous leg up in the general urban planning, urban de de development in New York or elsewhere, is really, really basic understanding of zoning and land, land use, um, which no one seems to get, so everyone has to learn it in, you know, when, when they're on the job. But um, I think that's really helpful, and it is very hard to do anything these days in anything related to urban development where that doesn't come into play. And I'm not so talking about the zoning rules in New York, but the basic way zoning works, uh, at least in America, I would say. I may not apply as much overseas, but the basic way zoning works in America and how that relates to what you can and can't do. Um, I think one thing I, I wish there was a class more on credit risk. Um, we did, you know, I was in all these finance courses and we would underwrite projects and we didn't really have a traditional um, commercial underwriter perspective. And my very first consulting gig right out of school I was yelled at in front of the entire office because I didn't know to look for an appraisal. And I just had no idea that you were supposed to find an appraisal if you were underwriting a you know, multifamily housing um, project. It's just one of those things that comes from real finance that you can't exceed the appraised value of the land. So maybe the appraisal was $10 million and I had structured some $30 million deal. <laughs> And this woman just ripped me apart. And I just thought, oh man, I, I never knew that. And I actually told Sean Larson, who teaches real estate finance, and he was joking that he's really sorry that he will teach his students that in his next classes. <laughs> but well, I mean, once that happens, you'll, you'll never forget about it. And I always <laughs> look for an appraisal. That is the first thing I ask for, what the appraised value is. <laughs> um, I think. Maybe in an international context, you know, looking back there, I could probably provide a long list of classes that I wish I had taken. 
uh, first of which are a series of classes on public finance that would have been very helpful. Uh, but I knew, knowing the scale, I, I, and I think this is, this is where the international and domestic context differ, knowing the scale that you want to work at in an international context is important because at one scale, you might be focused explicitly on a single sector or a single country, <clears throat> but when you're working sort of at a, at a bigger scale, at a higher scale, I've found in the, the consultancies that I've done, you really have to be capable of working across sectors and thinking sort of interdisciplinary and, and you know, big picture often, because that's what they're looking for, is how do you, how do, local processes uh, connect with what's going on from in, in the macro. And that, you know, it's hard to say what class you get that from. Um, but had I, you know, if you can project what, what you're going to be working on and at what scale you're going to be working on, then that's where I think you can think strategically about taking specific classes. But that, that's not the easiest thing to do. Thank you. <clears throat> I think with the integration of uh, Milano and GPIA, more students in your concentration will get exposure to the idea they can take a public finance course because mm -hmm. it's a requirement in the urban mm -hmm. program. So thank you very much. Um, we have time for maybe one last question, then we're going to go to speed networking. So change the tempo here a bit. And is there any one last question that we haven't had? So the question is, are you talking about focusing on one thing in an interview or one exceptional skill set in your entire presentation? If I could, yeah. entire yeah. research. Well, all I can say is, as anyone who went to grad school with me knows, I, I have tremendous ADD, so I certainly don't focus on one thing <laughs> in my uh, work. Um, but seriously, and, and very seriously in response to your question, no, very much not in your career. Because, you know, I think of the skills I learned. I, I was the best person to sit in New York doing U UDAC grants. That was great. It was sort of like, like so that with new market tax credits. Except when Ronald Reagan became president, they decided that government should be involved in such things, and they ended the UDAC pro program. So I had this great skill set that no one wanted. Um, so, you know, it's not that your career is going to move 100 different ways. But I, I think, on the other hand, when I walked in to see Bruce Ratner and basically said, I know more about UDAGs than anybody in New York City, um, which was probably true at the time. Um, you know, that was great. And he could hang on to that and say, gee, I want a UDAG. That's a great thing. <laughs> I mean, it didn't matter that my job ended up having nothing to do with UDAG, but it was <laughs> the thing that to translate to him. And I think what, again, what I keep coming back to is, you know, every, and particularly if you're going to be in the public sector, people are just overloaded, overworked, overburdened. They're seeing 100 people, including someone who's related to someone who knows the mayor. <laughs> you know, it's like just the nature of those jobs. And your ability to cut through is really critical. And so I think that skill is more to explain yourself than it is that, that and, and I wouldn't worry about, I think other people also, people worry, okay, if I say I'm an expert in zoning, then when I get the job, I'm gonna be a zoning person. It's, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. They think, oh my God, this is a really smart person. They have a skill, I, I wanna figure out a way to use them. You know, your career goes, you know, this firm that's all that works for could be doing EB-5 a year from yeah. now, right? We're thinking about yeah, which I, didn't even exist a year ago, so or no one knew about a year ago. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about. I think it's just the ability to sort of explain yourself and what you learned here in a very succinct way. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> some of you who've been to prior of these panels have done this before. Speed networking is an opportunity to, in small groups, ask more questions of these people and to get to know them a little bit. And it's like speed dating, except the objective is a tad different. So thank you very much.